Go ahead. Good morning. Seeing the presence of a quorum, I'm going to call the this meeting of GOL to order at 9.31 a.m. And pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 and 107 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to access the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. See instructions. Well, you don't have them below, but anyway, no in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. Um, so um, I'm going to uh, shift the agenda around a little bit uh, and we're gonna go with water and sewer regulations first because Amy Rusecki is here with us. So I'd like to do that. We're going to uh, probably not get to the snow and ice thing, which is not high on priority, but I have a little bit of new information. Um, and after we hear Amy and we talk about the water and sewer regs, we'll go to public comment because we have plenty of public. So um, with that, I'm going to, oh, can you bring Amy in? Oh, there she is. All right. Uh, Amy, I apologize. I hate being chair. Uh, so I always flop around. I apologize. Um, I read through, and I think the whole committee has read through the changes to the uh, water and sewer regulations. Do you want to uh, talk about anything specific right now, or do you want to just go? I think that I'll just preface it with a couple of things. So first of all, the changes that you guys are seeing are obviously from the town council's vote um, regarding ownership of the um, sewer service lines. Um, so most of it was just changing it back to the current ownership model versus, right. you know, um, what TSO had wanted when we first went through this. Um, but the other thing to note is because we know that this conversation is going to come around and the decision that was made wasn't, this isn't a forever decision. And so because of that, there were a couple of things that I put in that will make it easier. Um, things like if your sewer, um, if your uh, curb stop isn't on the property line, when you get work done on your sewer service line, you're going to bring that to the property line. And um, and then also if you're doing anything on your sewer service line, installing that clean out that most services in this town don't have currently, and that we will want in the future. So those are the two things that just kind of with this forward thought of if we ever do change the ownership model, these are things that we're going to want to see in place. So let's start that practice now. Amy, thank you. Any questions from counselors? Uh, Jennifer? You're muted, Jennifer. No, no. I think Jennifer, it's switching between your speakers and the headphones. Yeah, so no. No, I think you have to change the, the setting back to the system audio when you take your headphones off. And then when you start using them again, you have to change it to the headphone audio. No. Okay, any uh, any other questions from counselors? Uh, then um, I move, or someone, Mandy, probably going to have to help me here. I move that we recommend to the town council the change sewer and water regulations that were presented at the 315 GOL meeting. Uh, I'm, there... gonna I'm sorry. I'm going to suggest that we just hang on for a second because Jennifer is having remote okay. participation issues and she has her hand up. So I'm just going to ask that we hang on for a second. Sure. No problem. And, and Pat, 
we're, we just declare them clear, consistent, and actionable. actionable. Okay. Thank you. Jennifer, do you want to try and say something and see if we can hear you? No. Not audio. Audio. Oh, now we can hear you. You can hear me now. I have yeah. no idea. I haven't done anything differently. This happened before. The only thing I'm going to, I'm so this happened the last. I'm I'm out of the country. Right. It's okay. It's the tomorrow. headphones. Yeah, but there's no. It sometimes works and doesn't. And there's no change in setting. Anyway, I was just going to say, what I feel really uncomfortable voting in the you know to approve this, even this one vote because it. I'm very torn because it seems. And I know this has always been the case, but it just seems so crazy that individual homeowners are responsible for the line that's not under their property. And depending on where you are, like I always refer to Dorothy Pan, she's on a main street. She lives on a main street in Amherst, but her sewer line doesn't come, it, it's, it's all the way down Amity and then partially down Sunset before her line connects with the town. And she got hit with like a $38,000 bill that she was lucky enough that her homeowners in, um, insurance covered it. But it just doesn't feel right approving language that leaves residents that vulnerable. Okay. And so, Jennifer, yeah. I'm sorry. Jennifer, I made a mistake because we're not approving um the the regulations we're saying that they're clear consistent and actionable so that's what we're doing and i you know so okay. the approval or disapproval will happen in town council get to the council okay i'm sorry no do not apologize <laughs> i'm the one who needs to apologize because i said it wrong okay um, thank you so so uh mandy restate the motion and somebody second it the motion is to declare the proposed water and sewer regulation drafts of March 15, 2023, clear, consistent, and actionable. Second. Okay. All right. And so we'll take a vote on that. Lynn Griesmer? Aye. Mandy Jo Haneke? Aye. Jennifer Taub? Aye. And I'm an aye. Does anyone know why Michelle is not here? She was. She's not able to be here today. Well, that's too bad because she also supported the public comment changes. Um, okay, uh, Amy, do you need anything else from us? No, I, I may just continue to listen if you guys get to snow and ice, um, just to kind of be available if there's any questions on that. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do will say to you because I don't know whether we will, given what's else is on the agenda. I, to be but, clear, I will do work on the side and. Oh, have good. It. You too. <laughs> um, what I wanted to say was I have not received a response from the tree warden about what he sees as an issue. I've gotten a copy of the letter that DPW sends out, and um, that's in our packet, I think. Um, and so I don't, if we get to it, we will have some questions, but. Okay. And given, um, how can, they're amazing. Um, it's incredible uh, for a GOL meeting to have 17 attendees. I certainly understand why. Lynn? Yeah. Um, given that this was an item referred back to the counts, to the committee, before we move to public comment, could we at least have some initial comments from the committee? That's fine with me. Um, I feel, oh, go ahead. Other counselors? Uh, 
Jennifer, can I, can I just clarify something? We're moving yep. on to item seven in our agenda and skipping for now the two proclamations. Yes, we are. Okay, thank you for the clarification. Yep. Jennifer? Um, yeah, so this is to comment on the referral, the substance <clears throat> of the referral back to the committee. So I, 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 I don't support um, the changes to public comment. I think I, I liked, you know, what, what was in uh, the rules of procedure, you know, prior to the conversation. The one that I would support, I guess the one change I would support, and I think it was uh, Councillor Miller's um, suggestion, it's 5.1b that I think the way the rules of procedure read, currently read is that the presiding officer can limit public comment to one minute and Councillor Miller proposed that it be two and um, I would be supportive of that change. But I, in the last council meeting, I didn't vote to refer the matter back to GOL because I would have preferred that we voted, frankly, down the proposed changes at the council meeting. So that's, I don't, so that's where I stand. I don't see any, um, I don't think that our meetings are made longer by public comment and when they are, it's because there's an important matter. So I would want to keep it as it was. And I, I'm very uncomfortable also with the item that says once public comment begins, you can't remotely raise your hand because I think that if a statement is made that may be factually incorrect, um, a member of the public should have the option to hit the raised hand button and respond to that. So I could say more later, but those are that's roughly where my, my position, um, thanks. Thank you, I'm gonna call on Athena. Thanks, Michelle had shared some comments that she asked um, asked us to read at the meeting because she's not able to be here. If it's okay with you, Pat, I'll read that. Sure. Um, so Michelle wrote, I strongly disagree with limiting public comment at this time when the charter is in its infancy and we have not explored other ways to reduce meeting times. Many residents have expressed concern about limiting public comment and doing so now would undermine the trust we are seeking to build with the community. As we approach a charter review, it is critical we ensure the public that our new form of government enables a healthy and robust democratic process. We have other ways to reach the objective of reducing meeting times, and I urge us to creatively consider other possibilities before making changes that limit the public's ability to provide valuable input. Thank you, Athena. I, I want to comment. I'm, um, I support in many ways what she's saying. However, she did not speak out during the meeting and actually supported the um, decision. So I'm a little uncomfortable right now. Um, <laughs> I'm a little uncomfortable with her lack of presence and, and I have to be honest about that. And, and the statement, while it is a good one, and I think we're all aware uh, of the public uh, input into this, um, but I wish she had spoken up as clearly and directly during the last meeting. Uh, Mandy? Thank you. Um, I don't know what to do with the current, um, our current rules, both 5.1 and the rule six issues. Um, because we had our discussion, you know, and, and it was very valuable to hear from everyone and all, but with the new Southborough ruling that came out, um, I think that again changes how I'm thinking about all of this. Um, because that ruling with how our rules are currently written, things like if time allows without defining what time allows means in terms of whether non-residents can speak or not. Um, you know, it means that given what the SJC just said in Southboro, um, without any guardrails at all about who or when you can sign up or um, how long it goes or at what point, if any, a counselor can request that we move on from public comment um, without any time limits at all, um, Given what Southboro said, we could face a situation where we have 
40, 50, 60 people that live in Florida or Michigan that are part of that First Amendment audit issue coming to a council meeting, taking three minutes of time, each of them, all three minutes, spouting some very nasty rhetoric, and we have to sit there and listen to it. And nothing in our rules right now says we can stop it. And given Southboro, the chair would not be able to stop any person in under three minutes, um, whether or not it even, as long as they are saying something that plausibly relates to our um, business, not even our business on an agenda, our, our, uh, our, our jurisdiction, within our jurisdiction, um, a chair can't stop anyone right now from saying anything. Um, given the SJC ruling. And so I think we need to think about how that ruling could or could not impact and how we would want it to impact or not impact um, the issues that we were discussing last meeting and at the council meeting that brought the referral back. Um, think about some of the Zoom bombings we've had, not in our council meetings, thankfully, but in other meetings where public comment potentially has been stopped because of some things that have said that aren't now clearly are not able to be stopped um, given the Southboro ruling. And I think we have to think about that potentially happening given that we just had a First Amendment audit um, of our town hall and what individuals might aim to go after public meetings for similar things. I don't know what the solution is, but I think we need to consider those possibilities as we discuss this referral. Right. I do want to say that we can limit, I'm not saying this is what we're going to decide, but the we can still have time limits and things like that on how long someone can speak, et cetera. So it's not, uh, we're requiring the, what the SJC is saying that we need to meet in a, people, uh, residents, non-residents who's ever speaking need to do so in a peaceable and orderly manner and that the things be consistent with time, place, and uh, manner restrictions. So I think there's a lot of looking. I went into um, public, you know, to code of conduct and there's, we're going to, this is not going to get decided today, but I think the re-referral part is an important part of the discussion today. Uh, Lynn and then Jennifer, since you've already spoken once. Um, first of all, I want to express appreciation for uh, Mandy Jo and Jennifer's comments, as well as Michelle's, even though she's not here. Um, mm -hmm. I think we heard significantly from the public, but I also want the public to understand that in addition to the referral back to the committee, the next day was the day that the SJC ruling was released. That ruling uh, is, I believe, in our packet, and I am going to strongly recommend that we leave everything in this section of the rules as it is for the moment, and that we uh, ask the chair to invite the uh, town council, our town attorney, to attend a meeting of this committee where we have a thorough discussion of the implications of the SJC ruling before we do anything else to our rules of procedure that might be considered trying to control people's conduct or public comment. I think we have a serious legal um, issue in front of us and we have clearly heard from the public. And so mm -hmm. I'm strongly recommending that the rules stand as they are now which means none of the changes that were brought forward to the council at the last meeting go forward at this time, even the one minute rule. Just leave it the way it is. Jennifer? Um, yeah, I would, well, agree with Lynn to, to leave as the rules as they are and just caution. I mean, it sounds like we will meet with legal counsel that, that with it, we will invite them to come to the GOL meeting and, and maybe even to the full council but that we not over correct by, um, you know, constraining public comment on, on the off, you know, on the unlikely 
chance that someone's going to take over um, our meeting, our public meetings. So what I'm hearing is um, a, a suggestion to refer the, for me to contact the town attorney um, and set up a meeting with them before we go forward. And I think that's an excellent idea because tampering with something that we don't totally understand can create a mess. Um, so it, it, does that need to be um, a motion or no? Okay, then, then I'm gonna go forward with today's public comment um, and I'm gonna invite people to raise their hand and to speak. Dorothy, Pam. You wanna say for how long, Pat? <laughs> no more than three minutes. Thank you, Athena. Hello, as you know, I rarely speak three minutes long. Um, I have, as I'm sure you have too, received incredible mail from all kinds of people, people I know, people I've never, have never written to before. Um, and um, the best thing is just this from the League of Women Voters, all right? We believe local government should maximize widespread and inclusive participation. Hearing of diverse points of view encourages involvement. Being part of the process creates understanding and ownership of decisions. Expression of various opinions promotes a sense of inclusion. And I, I thought, you know, you just can't do better than that. Participation, uh, involvement, um, understanding, and inclusion. And I think that's what we're supposed to be doing. So I support, um, do not support these new proposed changes. Although I agree with Pat that, um, you know, because everybody does not speak three, three full minutes. And I, I do think that at two minutes, uh, depending upon how many people, you know, Lynn has often done this, depending upon how many people have signed up, she sometimes shortens the uh, time that each person can speak, um, which seems a reasonable response. So thank you for allowing me to speak. Okay, thank you. Uh, Athena, could we have a clock? We probably won't need it, but can we do that? I'm, I'm not set up for that right now. I don't usually do that in committee meetings. Okay, thank you. I will try to. Pat, I, I could do a timer on my phone, but okay. I've got it on my phone. Thanks. Yeah, Janet Keller, thank you for coming. Thank you, Pat. Janet Keller, um, 120 Pulpit Hill Road in North Amherst. I uh, do not support the changes. I'm happy that you are going to look at this in more depth. I, I hope that you're going to do that. I uh, agree with the main assertions that folks have made that it is not public comment that is causing the workload of the council and uh, folks to be so um, onerous and that a, a, a careful look needs to be taken at the reasons uh, that the workload is so um, heavy, but it's not public comments. And when we show up in these kinds of numbers, it's because we um, feel that we need to reassure ourselves that you um, you understand how important your decisions are to our lives and that we take that very seriously and we, um, we, we need to be heard and we need to feel that this is a welcome place. Uh, I felt um, very bad when I heard Brianna say that she didn't feel comfortable coming to a meeting and speaking. And I know many people don't. So um, I hope that one of the outcomes of this, I hope with all my heart that one of the outcomes of this um, 
unfortunate um, event is that we all feel more open and welcome to uh, participate. Thank you. Thank you. Birdie? Hello, my name is Birdie Newman. I'm from District 3, um, and I am also commenting in opposition to the proposed changes that would allow counselors to cut off public comment at the start of a meeting after 30 minutes. It's crucial for the public to be able to make ourselves heard at town council meetings in advance of votes. I also disagree with the idea of limiting comments by non-residents because lots of people who do not or cannot live in Amherst continue to have a stake in town politics. I know I'm speaking in agreement with many other members of the public who spoke out on March 6th, so please heed our voices now so that we can continue to be heard later. In terms of the Southboro ruling, it sounds like there will be an opportunity to respond to this more carefully in the coming weeks. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comments, Bertie. Tony Cunningham? Hi, thank you, Tony Cunningham, Owen Drive. I think this is my first time attending a GOL meeting. I tuned in today to express my opposition to the proposed rule change that would limit public comment to 30 minutes at the beginning of council meetings and limit input from non-residents. I wasn't aware of the South Borough decision before now, so I'm not sure my comments today are as necessary. I support leaving the rules as they were with respect to public comment. The council manager form of government was sold to Amherst voters as an improvement over town meeting allowing for greater input and participation by members of the public. The rule change proposal runs counter to that promise and counter to basic democratic principles. Your meetings run long, often because the council has bitten off more than it can chew, taking up innumerable tangential issues that may not be important to a critical mass of residents. I suggest the council try to focus more on what is important, prioritize your work, and limit it to what is most important to residents, perhaps then your agendas won't be so packed and you will have more time for hearing from those that you represent. Thank you. Thank you for your comments, Tony. Anita Sorrow. Thank you, Pat. My name is Anita Sorrow. I'm in uh, District 5 and I appreciate uh, the suggestion to put this off until to allow further discussion. Um, I agree the new case is important to consider, but not, but it has to be in context. Um, <clears throat> my understanding of why these changes were made were, was that it was out of the concern to ease the burden on counselors to address issues of, of having to, uh, talk about things well well into uh, the night. Uh, and I agree with that goal, but it should not be at the risk of community engagement, which is an important call. So I, I ask that while the case is important, it should be kept in the context of what is good for this town and not um, make paramount the First Amendment rights of people in other states. Um, there is a need for people to express their points of view. There is also a need for counselors to hear our voices uh, in order to fully inform the decisions that you're making on our behalf. So I ask you to please consider all of the aspects in the context of why this uh, these changes originally arose. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Are there any other people uh, who are attending who would like to speak before I close public comment for this meeting? Okay. And I, seeing no hands raised, I'm going to close the public comment period for this meeting. And I'm going to suggest uh, that we move on to the proclamations. And uh, there, in the packet, we have the Jewish Heritage um, Proclamation. I did not receive an updated Arbor Month proclamation from either 
uh, the uh, the committee sponsor, the commission sponsor, or the council sponsor. But I would like to suggest that I take that and make any changes necessary. Contact the and and um, move forward so that we can have it voted on at the council meeting if I have the uh, committee's uh, permission to do that. Does that feel comfortable to people? All right. So that will be on the town council agenda on the 20th. Um, the Jewish heritage. Jennifer, do you want to speak to that at all or? Um, <clears throat> no, we, uh, I believe the same sponsors sponsored it uh, last year. <clears throat> and we have um, community, same uh, community responsors. We did um, just update the language to reflect unfortunately, the increase in um, hate crimes that's been experienced in the last few years. Um, I think that's probably what's you know, different from uh, last year. And we appreciate um, the chance to be able to bring it before GOL and the town council. And we um, look forward to reading the proclamation and having uh, festivities around it um, on April 18th uh, on the steps of town hall. I don't think we have an hour set yet. Okay. Um, are there any questions or anything that needs to be looked at? Amanda? Um, one, one small change and then a question about the date that um, Jennifer just said. So the small changes in the last whereas that has the hanging and the last whereas should just end with a period. Um, and you, you said April 18th, but we're proclaiming May. Yeah. Jewish American Heritage Month is okay. So, um, <laughs> yeah. So I think that last year we did the reading a little before. So I didn't come up the April eighteenth. I think is Dorothy Pam still in the audience? I think I got that from her. I think that the reading last year was on Holocaust Remembrance Day. I but mm -hmm. and I'm not sure if that's maybe where we got April eighteenth. That is correct. Okay. So okay, could we read it then? I think that's, yeah. I, I just had the question because okay. we took the read them question. in the month they are, but but right. given that date, that makes sense. Okay, thanks for the explanation. Okay, anything else? I, know, I could just add, just to come, I learned something I did want to say when we, and this was another edition we made this year that I hadn't, known that the University of Massachusetts back in the 50s and 60s was one of was really a leader in not um, enforcing or clinging to quotas and that they really welcomed uh, Jewish faculty members and that is a really one a reason that we have such a thriving Jewish community in Amherst so I just shout out to you mass <laughs> Lynn yeah, I just want to recognize that uh, at least one of the community sponsors is in the audience, Hilda Greenbaum, Greenbaum, and uh, I don't see any others, but I didn't know if you wanted to have them make any comments. And Dorothy has her hand up too. All right, that's fine with me. Let's go to Hilda Greenbaum, if she'd like to speak. I have nothing to add, so right, I'll just sit here and listen. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dorothy. I checked my calendar from last year and it. Did you, did you hear me? Shall I start again? We only heard part of it, Dorothy. Okay. Can you begin again? Yeah. I checked my date book from last year and we had it on April uh, 23rd, which was Holocaust uh, Memorial Day then. And, um, no, wait a minute, let me put my glasses on. April 28th, okay. Um, so April is the official month that was declared. Of course, we can do whatever we want, but um, when George Bush established this, uh, he said that April would be the Jewish American Heritage Month, probably because Holocaust Memorial Day, it changes in various dates in April. So we're hoping, and we did not get official, we're waiting for Lynn to tell us if this is, uh, can, that we can do it, um, so we would like very much to have it on Holocaust Memorial Day again this year, which would be, um, I guess, at the April 18th date. So, you know, she'll have to get back to us. Um, 
beyond that, um, you know, uh, I, I also want to thank Hilda. Hilda did, did a great job of connecting me to uh, sources in town, uh, both written and uh, people who had done research and, on it. And so had uh, Rachel Vigerman also connected me to good sources. So it's, I really feel a strong community base for this one. Um, so I hope that this will go forward. And thank you, Mandy. Um, I, when I saw that last and I thought, is that what we need to do? And I wasn't sure. So I'm glad that you know, and that you can correct that. So thank you. Okay, thank you, Mandy, and then Lynn. I'm just still now confused. Dorothy just said April, but I actually just Googled and it's still May. So I just want to make sure we declare the correct month. <laughs> right. This will come to a vote on the 20th. So um, it, excuse me, Pat, but April 18th, uh, actually starting at sundown on April 17th to uh, April 18th is Holocaust Remembrance Day. Um, I want to make sure that, yeah, so I just need to confer with um, town hall people as to what time would work best for them. But if there are specific requests from the sponsors, including the community sponsors, please state that now and that's what we'll go with. Is there any response from the sponsors? <clears throat> um, it's good for me, Dorothy. She's still there? And, and Hilda? Yeah, so that's a mistake. Uh, okay, so what I see what I was wondering, where's Mandy getting the, the April, the May? That must be a mistake on our part, Mandy. Okay, so eagle eyes again. I mean, you know, you look at something a million times, you have a whole bunch of people looking at them, and we still don't see it. It's supposed to be April. That is a, it a, a needs to be corrected on the proclamation. Mandy? So, so I. I guess I'm not sure. When I Google it, it appears to be May. So Google, I think the right. proclamation is right. It's just when Dorothy said April, it just. It, no, it was in April last year. We want it in April this year. Right, but the but the May is the month that George huh. Bush proclaimed to be. Is it? I'd have to check. I don't know. Um, American Jewish Heritage Month. Okay, so here that little that little word that's the the word proclaimed in that first paragraph. Um, it's supposed to be a link, and I don't, I don't, I'm sure it's not a link anymore. That link would take us to the internet. I can check that later um, to no, see I, what he said. It, it I says, think Jennifer's right that Jewish American Heritage Month, month is in May, and so I just want to confirm that that's the date, the month you want Amherst to proclaim, too. Jewish Heritage Month is in April. No, it is, is not. Then, oh, okay, Jewish Heritage Month. Okay, I'm getting two things confused. Holocaust, Remembrance Day, and Jewish Heritage Month. Okay. Well, that's I just want to confirm well you, deals with. Okay. Um, you want the flag raising on the 18th because that is Holocaust Remembrance Day, but the proclamation um, is actually the for the month of May for okay, got Jewish Heritage Month. Okay. Right. So okay. can, can we and have the last ceremony? Year. Go ahead. Can we have the ceremony on, on um, Holocaust Remembrance Day announcing that the next month, May, is Jewish Heritage Month? Yes. Okay, good. Thank you. That's clear. Mandy and then, Je well, Lynn, did you have a comment? Okay, Mandy and then Jennifer. I apologize. Lynn just said something about a flag raising. So is there an intent to raise a flag? And if so, it needs to be included in our now, therefore. It's, no, that was my okay. mistake. It's only <laughs> was... a proclamation reading. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Jennifer? Just quickly, I think the confusion came, it was always May, it was Jewish American Heritage Month. Last year, I believe Holocaust Remembrance Day was like April 28th, very close to May. So that's when we read the proclamation and also acknowledged that it was Holocaust Remembrance Day. I wanna so ask that, a question. Confusion. I'm sorry, Jennifer, I spoke over well, that's you. It. I, no, no, that's, I was just trying to explain. No, that's the helpful. Um, yeah. uh, what, isn't there a Holocaust Memorial Proclamation? And if so, why, um, 
Was there a separate proclamation? Or re I'm trying I don't to think remember. There was it's last just that year. it was read on. Gotcha. Okay, thank you. Well, then I'd like to put forward uh, a motion that um, we find that GOL finds the Jewish heritage. Um, I'm not looking at the full name of the proclamation. Um, Jewish Heritage Month proclamation clear, consistent, and actionable as amended. Second. Is there a second? Thank you, Jennifer. All right. We'll go around. Jennifer, vote. Yes. Mandy? Aye. Lynn? Aye. And I'm an aye. Thank you. That's unanimous. All right. Um, Barbara, Mon I have a couple of questions. Um, I want to, um, Athena, could you put, I apologize, could you put the agenda back up for a moment? I can't find. Sorry. Well, right now, I'm, I have several proclamations and res that have come up that I, I do not want to deal with today, but I would like to deal with on our meeting on the 29th. One of them is the children's mental health um, awareness proclamation, which, and that week is May 7th through the 13th. So I wanted to place that on the March 29th GOL agenda. And therefore, it would could be voted on by the town council on in April, and then the universal free lunch, uh, which I think um, also, um, again, I did not receive these in time for the packet, and I want to cl clarify something with Athena, but I would like to do that on the 29th as well. Um, and Athena, I'm trying to understand. How late can we receive? Because if it's 48 hours in advance that we get um, we get a proclamation or a resolution, uh, that would be at Monday morning. Is that correct? So if if something comes in um, Monday afternoon, it doesn't meet the 48 hour rule. It doesn't get inserted. Right, and and if I could um, just say, if if something comes in after that forty eight hour deadline, and it was, I, th I think, in terms of proclamations and resolutions and so on, it's going to be very unusual to not know about something forty eight hours ahead of the meeting. I mean, that would be like, you know, and so should something I... happened in the world <laughs> within the last within the forty eight hours between. Right. So it, otherwise it's gonna be, um, you know, something's not gonna be, um, it wouldn't be appropriate to put it on under 48 hours in terms of resolutions and proclamations. Okay. And when something uh, has been like, if Lynn sends me a thing about, oh, this is the, uh, I've been assuming that you have gotten it also and would add it to the packet. And am I incorrect about that process? Um, one other thing I wanted to add to the the forty eight hour thing is, you're correct that it's it would be Monday at nine thirty, but I need like flashing red lights to let me know that something gets added that late before uh, a committee meeting so that I can update the agenda if something does get added right before the deadline. Okay. Um, and then your question was about um, I'm sorry. Can you repeat your other question? I don't remember exactly what it was right now, Liz. Um, I, the 48 hours that, but, um, oh. Oh, if Lynn, Lynn sends something. If Lynn yeah. sends me like the, um, ch um, the food, the ch uh, child's health, mental health awareness or whatever, um, I've been assuming that it, it's being referred to you as well. And is that an error on my part? So I should be contacting you when I get those. Um, I'm not sure if you're talking about Lynn sending you 
individually an email about a proclamation or to the entire council as an official referral. Usually I see those official referral emails and add them to the packet, but it's never safe to assume <laughs> that I right. have everything and can add it to your packets. It's good to check in and make sure that we're on the same page about what's going on on the GOL agenda and that everything's in the packet that you expect. Okay, all right. I, I do my best, but. Oh, I know you do. I'm I'm not worried about you. I'm worried about me and make, making sure that I know exactly the steps that support your work. So you need to stop apologizing for yourself, please. Um, that's a demand. That's a, I move <laughs> that Athena stop doing that. Is there a second? Um, Lynn? Yeah, a couple things. Based on uh, the GOL's discussion and particularly your requests, uh, I have sent two counselors um, emails that relate to getting proclamations to the GOL. Um, we you're muted, Lynn. So GOL does not spend its time. Um, can you hear me now? Yes. 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 So the GOL does not spend its time doing little edits. Okay. So that it's really a much more fruitful discussion. Jennifer uh, did exactly that. Uh, and I think that um, if we know something's coming, but we don't have a final form, we could list it on the agenda so that it's on there between 48 hours. But if we got it on Monday morning, it would still be okay. Um, but actually, if we don't know that, and unless the event is happening between now and the time we have a council meeting, we can put it on or we can take it to the council and bypass GOL, which sometimes can get messy if the council starts getting into editing, which is one of the time consuming things that happens in the council occasionally. We try not to do it though. Just some comments, thanks. Any other comments around this issue? Okay, but then I'm going to, uh, we have talked about moving the public dialogue uh, discussion till um, with good reason because we need the KP law referral. So I'm looking at the agenda again and I'm trying to, I, we could go to snow and ice, but as I said, um, we don't have that information. So I'm trying to uh, figure out where we go next. Mandy? Um, I'm just curious on the agenda, um, if we're not gonna do snow and ice, we still have minutes to do, but does yeah. is the agenda broad enough to continue the rules of procedure review outside of the rules that were mentioned? And would we wanna do that? I, I don't even remember what ones are listed, but would we wanna do that if it is broad enough to uh, accommodate the whole thing? instead uh, of just the three that were mentioned. Uh, we could go to snow and ice, and we can also continue with um, other look, uh, looking at uh, rules and procedure beyond that. Is there a response from any other counselor? I'd like at least the update on, on snow and ice. Uh, Jennifer first, and then I'll give you that update. Yeah, no, just that I will be signing off in about 10 minutes. Yeah, no, I know that, yeah. Um, let me see where I have. Uh, I'm trying to find Paul's comments. Oh, here we go. Okay. Um, so in terms of snow and ice, we have, and which is now obstruction of public ways bylaw, the things that we're still missing is a real response from the tree warden about around his concern about language in the bylaw being uh, um, enabling a resident to cut down a healthy tree. So that needs to be clarified, but I have gotten no response from him or DPW. But what Paul said, and this is, a this is um, he reviewed the uh, proposed changes. He does not recommend uh, to the change in enforcement designees uh, currently, the enforcement officers are identified as police officers, which include the parking enforcement officers. 
The proposal is to designate the following building commissioner inspect, inspectional service traffic enforce, enforcement officer or department of public works. And then Paul goes on to say, currently, if a complaint is filed with the police department, parking enforcement officers are assigned to visit the residents, seek a resolution and issue a non-criminal disposition citation if necessary. The current bylaw addresses snow and ice complaints and typically during snow and ice events, the parking enforcement officers are readily available to address these situations. In addition, parking enforcement officers are trained in the issuance of citations and are experienced in working with people who are receiving citations. The process maintains quality accounting and fiduciary control in one department. It also provides clarity as to which department is responsible for enforcement. Having multiple enforcement designees can create confusion and overlap of responsibility. Clear lines of authority and responsibility should be incorporated as part of this bylaw. So his recommendation is to keep the enforcement agent police officers. Um, are there questions about that or comments? Responses? Mandy? I, I respect that, that comment, but I think it ignores the problem we've heard from many people about you go to the police department, you complain, and they send you to DPW, and you never see anything get done. You go to DPW, and they send you to the police department. Like Even as it's written now with just police officers, things don't seem to be getting enforced. Um, we've heard that from multiple people in our public comments about the, not just the confusion, but the sidewalks don't get clear after complaints. Within a day, within two days, within a week, they just stay unclear no matter who you've called. Um, and and it, I think we're struggling with how do we fix that issue, right? The parking enforcement officer isn't going to clear the sidewalk if within 24 hours of issuing the citation, if they even issue one. Um, but if they do, if it's not cleared within 24 hours, it would be DPW that does that. But DPW, there's no communication, right? And so how do we fix that issue if we don't include enforcement by everyone else. And so I guess I guess that's a lot of questions for Paul. Is parking enforcement actually issuing citations? And if so, who's doing the clearing if they're not if it's not cleared after 24 hours? How's that internal system working? Because from the from externally, it doesn't seem to be working at all. Yeah, I would agree with that. Yeah. Anyone else want to comment on this, Jennifer? Yeah, I might have a question. Um, is it the responsibility of the parking, who, who's ever responsible for giving the citation, is it then their responsibility to do the clearing if for some reason the homeowner can't or isn't doing it? I, I didn't, so that's new information to me that they would then do the removal. I just was just asking for some clarification. I don't, Mandy? So the current bylaw says that the manager may, after notice to the property owner and an opportunity to be heard, perform or otherwise cause the clearing or treating to be performed and then recover the expenses not to exceed $500. So I don't think we use that one at all, um, which is you know potentially part of the problem, right? Um, a lot of the issues with this beyond only covering snow and ice are enforcement. And Paul's email didn't really address why enforcement isn't happening from the external point of view of residents. Lynn? Yeah, it seems to me that um, I'm hearing several things. I'm hearing some confusion over what happens next, and I'm hearing a lot about who does what next. And so it seems to me that maybe we want to ask Paul and whoever else he wants to bring with him to have a conversation with us about this before we do anything else with it. That makes sense. And I mean, perhaps if we invited the tree warden um, to that meeting as well, it would be helpful. Jennifer? Yeah, no, I was just going to say, this is one of these issues that before I was on the council really had no idea was so 
such an important and such a big issue because this yes the sidewalks need to be cleared but there's people who can't physically do it themselves and may not have them either have the means to retain someone or or have somebody come to do it that quickly so it, it's a real tough situation they have to be cleared but then you know you don't want to have to um sort of, you know, really come down on someone if there's a reason why they haven't been able to clear it. And it might be because they haven't been able to have somebody come out to do it, but that doesn't help somebody needs to make their way down the street and can't. So anyway, I'm just, th this is one of those issues that you wouldn't think <laughs> would be so complicated, but it really is. Right, right. I don't know, um, Amy is not in the audience. I don't know if she wants to make any comments or if she has. She may, she was going to She's be here. working nearby. Ah, there you are. Amy, any comments on this? Um, I, I only to say I did reach out to Alan Snow, the tree warden, um, and he just said, yes, I owe you information. He wants to um, just do a little bit of research on neighboring communities to figure out how they word it well, because he, you know, He's got this concern, but obviously we need to kind of wrangle how to word that properly. So um, that makes sense. That's, that's helpful. Yeah. That's so helpful to know. Um, I told him after I left this meeting that was probably going to be a homework assignment that he had to get done in the short term. So for <laughs> what it's worth, he'll get on that. Soon. <laughs> well, I wish you know he had let us know, and, and that yeah. that would have been good. Uh, but I'm glad that he's on it. So, um, yeah. any other questions for Amy or? I'm not sure we're ready. We, there's still too much work to, that has to be done on this. And I will send an email to Paul with our questions and concerns. Um, and yeah, I think we can, I think that's it for now, Amy. You could actually go away this time, maybe. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, I, uh, the suggestion was, if possible, to go on to other parts of the rules of procedure. And if uh, people uh, would like to do that, I know, Jennifer, you're going to be leaving fairly soon, but um, the places that I see are in Rule 7 and 8. Uh, and I'd like to give Andy a chance to to address some of the legislative action stuff in rule eight, but in rule seven uh, under um, 7.1, uh, um, motion shall comply with rules as set forth herein. And then there's a listing what, uh, when a measure is under debate. Thank you, thank you, thank you. If we scroll down to the following motions are not debatable. And then it says all, yeah. All other motions shall be debatable. And then there's this addition of time limits for debate. Now, this is in terms of the council. And is this something, Mandy? So, yeah, um, this is part of my set of proposals that was thinking about how do we try to reduce counselor burden and particularly the time of council meetings. And I, again, debate, right? This is not uh, the times, the voting quantums, all of that was just something to put something in there because we're supposed to propose full rules. Um, so when thinking about debates, I've noticed that there's sometimes a couple of different types of debates the council have, but they don't always determine, you know, but those types don't always determine length of debate. Sometimes we go on forever. Um, so, so when thinking about the ones we debate a while, you know, there's, there's a lot of stuff we can get done in 10 or 15 minutes in an action item or that's on the consent agenda. But when we go for 45 minutes, an hour, an hour and a half on an item, what, what are the, what are we going that long for is some of my thought. And when I was thinking about it, I sort of saw two potential reasons. Um, one, there really is a discussion and people are undecided. 
counselors are undecided as to how they're going to vote. We're maybe rehashing language or proposing language or working through some potential changes to language because of how we don't know how we want to vote or whether it's the right vote and all. Um, those debates are going to take a while and should take a while. But then there's sometimes where it appears that after 10 or 15 minutes, all 13 of us know exactly how we're going to vote, yet we go on for another hour um, with just talking. And, and that is sort of not necessarily the most productive use of the council's time if we've already all decided how we're going to vote. Um, and so how do we limit those types of conversations to to potentially reduce meeting time. And so this was one of the proposals I came up with, or one of the thoughts I came up with was, um, I, in the past I've proposed things like at any point in time, making a motion to end debate, um, to close debate, sort of an interruptible motion where you don't have to be recognized by the chair. You can't interrupt a speaker, but you don't have to be recognized such that if there's eight people, if there's six hands up of counselors, and you decide you wanna make a motion to close debate, you don't have to wait for five others. You could make it beforehand and see if it succeeds. That one failed the last time I proposed that. So I'm proposing something else. I'd be happy to consider the that one again, um, where instead of needing two thirds, at some point, instead of needing two thirds of counselors to end debate, we make an affirmative decision to continue debate after a certain amount of time has passed. And in this proposal, I had two sets of different times where the affirmative decision was at a majority at one point, and then after a certain amount of time, it needed two thirds to continue. But it's just another way of looking at, at when is an appropriate time for us to move on and actually just vote? Um, and are we accomplishing anything after a certain amount of time that is moving the discussion forward or continuing to help people decide or should we be voting when everyone's already made their decision and stopping the discussion so just another option in thinking about how can we shorten meetings and i'd love to hear people's thoughts on our side of the debates on how we can potentially shorten meetings okay thank you mandy comments questions jennifer are you are you saying goodbye or do you? Yeah, I'm really sorry to have to do this, but I have to get to a plane, but. Do you have a quick quick response though? Um, <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> no, I really have to read this. I, yeah. 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 Thank you, I'm sorry to have to Thank leave you. now. No, but, no, don't okay. apologize. Thank yeah, you. Uh, Lynn? Well, I think it's productive for us to have a continued debate. I just wanna make note that two members are no longer here. And uh, I want to be careful that we um, don't try to do any motions, but yeah. just continue. Thank you. Yeah, I th yeah, I think that's accurate. Although we are quorum and we could, but I agree. Um, one of the things, Mandy, I'm cons I'm wondering about is the two thirds. That's nine people. Um, why nine versus seven? So, so right now, a motion to end debate requires nine, no matter when it's made, whether it's made five minutes in, whether it's made an hour in, it still requires nine. And so I, I chose this sort of two-tiered system where the first time, sort of the first time a motion to continue debate would be made, you'd only need a majority. Um, but then after a certain amount of time that debate has occurred, maybe we want to need a supermajority to continue debate. So sort of flipping the Roberts rules rule to instead of a supermajority to end debate, at some point a supermajority to continue debate. Up for discussion, but it was sort of mirroring in some sense the Roberts rules. Mm -hmm. And what about calling the question? Look, Which, that, that's, that's the Roberts rules to end debate. That's yeah, the call question. Right. Um, we wouldn't remove that rule. Um, Although at least I have not proposed removing the use of that rule. One of the other options would be potentially to change the, uh, in our rules to change the quantum of vote needed to pass a call the question from two thirds to a majority, right? Mm -hmm. um, we can do that through rule. Just trying to think of a variety of ways to shorten our meetings. <laughs> um, Lynn? 
Um, I think this gets at the heart of one of the reasons our meetings are long. And I hope that um, we can come up with a way to continue or not continue debate. The only thing that, the thing that pops up for me with this is the cre creation of confusion among counselors. It, it's a lot of motions to just d move along. And so um, in some ways, I just assume we do 20 minutes at a majority. If we go up after that 20 minutes, and that we leave it a major another 20 minutes or 10 minutes at another majority. And then, but not to remove the ability to call the previous question or move the previous question. I, I think that we should always keep that. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I'm I get, I must admit, I get frustrated as a counselor uh, about how long some uh, debates, conversations, discussions go on. And when I hear repetitive uh, information, um, and I think I uh, only a couple of times uh, did call the question, which I learned about when I was first in town meeting and saw how important it was uh, to move uh, at times to a vote um, or to end a discussion. Um, I. I feel like we, you know, and this is reflective of Southboro conduct and what what should counselor conduct be as well. But I'm really, I feel like there is less debate and more making of statements. There is, you know, the idea of there being two times to discuss an issue in the charter feels like an important thing. Uh, but what I find is that the same positions that are staked out at the first discussion are generally maintained, although there are sometimes changes. Um, and during that period, we're hearing from the residents. We're um, hopefully doing more research independently. But I, I'm concerned about... I'm concerned about... I guess politics, statements that are made to support your position um, that don't uh, advance us to a state where we can collaborate, um, where we can really hear each other. And I, I don't know how to address that. I really don't. Um, so that's kind of where I am. I'm certainly not ready to vote on this right now. Um, you know, there. Hmm. Anybody else? Well, I think we are not coming to a decision. Mandy? Yeah, just, just one thing. You know, I mentioned a proposal that Pat and I, in a, a two or three years ago, when I proposed, I think somewhere earlier in 7.1, I think it's, we're in seven, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. That you know, um, the the motion to adjourn is in order at any time except upon immediate repetition, right? Um, and I had proposed at one point making a motion to call the question in order, um, essentially at any time between speakers, um, to to again potentially again these are all potentials, right? You know, a lot of this requires, as Pat said. A lot of the repetition requires counselors to be quiet <laughs> and not repeat um, and, and police themselves in that sense, monitor themselves. But, but if at some point I decide that we've been talking an hour and I've thought the conversation has gotten repetitive and it's really the same two or three counselors speaking, but they all have their hands up and I put my hand up to make a motion, I still have to wait through those three, nine minutes of conversation before I can actually make the motion. So that's an automatic nine more minutes that even if there are nine counselors that would like to add and debate, you have to wait till you get to the motion. And so is what, what are people's thoughts on 
revisiting the issue or the potential for adding in a motion to call the question is in order at any time um, between speakers, sort of so, so that you don't have to wait through the three or four that already have their hands up to make Lynn? it. Thank you, Mandy. I, I actually would like us to revisit that uh, because, I mean, it is something the town meeting did use. It was used effectively at town meeting. And I think for many reasons, same for the same purpose that you're suggesting it. I'm not, I, I would like to hear other um, GOL members weigh in on that, uh, but I'd at least like to revisit that. Yeah, and I'm, I'm one, yeah, I agree. I, I am wondering, I, ju I just would like a real clarification. When the question, question is called that ends debate and I know with the PFAS thing there was a whole mess around that and so what actually happens I raise my hand in between speakers and I say I call the question or or, or I propose to end debate or whatever what's the next step in terms of the council being able to continue uh, discussion and I should know this but I don't so you're so you're asking if someone moves to to call the previous question, what what happens next? Mm -hmm. So um, if that when that happens, then it automatically ends debate. So we move to a vote on that ending debate and moving to the previous question, a vote on the previous question immediately. If the vote to move to that previous question fails, then debate continues. Okay, yeah. But Can discussion of the topic still continue? No. So, so if if the if the vote to call the question passes, then debate. It, 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 it's essentially the council saying, as a group, we're done with the discussion and we're just going to vote on the motion on the table now. So right. that that's the purpose of calling the previous question is saying we're done talking about it. And if councilors don't want to be done talking about it, then they would vote against. Calling the question. Calling yeah. the question. Mandy? So I think part of your question though, Pat, is um, there's there's discussions related to particular emotions and an actual action the council has to take. And then sometimes our discussions during those motions go a little wide and don't really talk about the motions. And I think that's where you were getting. Um, yeah. Back back in October, it, it, it goes similar to when a charter right to postpone is invoked. It postpones the question on the floor and debate on the question ends. But if that agenda item included other questions, right, it doesn't end the agenda item if there were other motions for that agenda item to be heard, right? Mm -hmm. or, um, or if we're in a discussion topic, or if there's a discussion topic. And so maybe we need some clarification around. I think that's part of the part of the reason we have discussion topics on our agenda and action items on the agenda. In theory, if it's an action item, all of the discussion should relate to the motion on the floor. Right. Um, and are we ready to vote on that motion? And I think sometimes our discussion gets wide of the actual thing we're being asked to vote on to other topics that are tangentially related to the thing we're being asked to vote on. Okay, thank you. Athena? I, I think one, one thing the council doesn't take advantage of very often is to raise a point of order when things go sort of in a direction that isn't related to the thing, to the actual agenda item. And that's exactly what a point of order is for. We're, we're having a conversation that's not related and someone can raise a point of order saying, this is outside the bounds of the thing on the table. So we're in, you know, could potentially be seen as um, violation of open meeting law and so forth. So anything that's outside the rules, there's there's also the option of creating a rule that, that deals with that specific instance, you know, the um, that issue of, of a conversation kind of going sideways and getting outside the bounds and if, if the council wanted to deal with that a different way, but I suggest that count, if counselors have that perspective that 
you, you use the point of order more. Mm. Lynn? I agree with that, Athena. And in addition, at later on in the agenda, if somebody felt there was an issue that was related but wasn't on the agenda, they can bring it up during future agenda items. And at that point, frankly, there can also be a discussion as to whether or not what someone is requesting is even within the purview of the council, because that is the other place where I see the council moving off target is they they go into areas that are not council business. Mm -hmm. They are the business of the town manager, the business of somebody else, but not the council. So um, if we're going to clarify that, I think you know we do need to mention they can bring it up during future agendas, but then at some point we need to also clarify what is in the purview of the council and what is not. Thank you. Uh, any other comment right now where we are? Otherwise, I'm going to. Uh, uh, I have a couple of things in seven that where there were requests for discussion uh, from counselors. And one of them, there's in my notes, and I apologize, I don't have the, uh, under the right to postpone. It says insert to be reviewed, but I think that's just on the. Um, but also the uh, where well, there was a request for discussion on 7.5 motions for reconsideration. And I must admit, I have not reviewed this material because I didn't think we'd get there today. Uh, but yeah. So yes. does anyone know what whoever requested this wants us to discuss about motions for reconsideration? Since there were no proposed changes? Uh, Athena? Um, I don't recall who proposed this, but the conversation at council in the past had been um, that counselors wanted to bring it up in terms of what new information is. Um, so I'm guessing that that's what it was about. That makes sense. Mandy? So, um, this motion, th this rule changes Robert's rules. Um, we could always consider going back to Robert's rules. Robert's rules does not allow motions from the non-prevailing side um, at all. Um, I, I, I think I think we added that in because um, we thought with new information that might be useful. Uh, the one thing I would ask for clarifying if we get rid of the non-prevailing side issue is um, clarify if a counselor was absent from a vote. Not mm -hmm. that they abstained, but they were absent from the meeting. Are they allowed to ask for a motion for reconsideration, particularly if a motion failed due to a tie? Particularly, but, but for other reasons too. I mean, you know, if we've got one person absent, you might have a 6-6 six, six tie and a motion fails. Um, if you've got two people absent, you might have a 6-5 vote, but if those two people come to the next meeting and we're going to vote on the same side as the five, would it be worth reconsidering? Like, I, I think we should, if we're going to revisit this rule, we should clarify things about counselors who are absent from the meeting and yeah. whether they have a right to request reconsideration. Yeah. In a certain way, just off the top of my head, that feels fair. I am concerned. I think that if you choose to abstain, that the, that you not be given that privilege. Uh, and that feels important to me. Um, I think, yeah. Yeah, so if we could put that note in there too, just, yeah, thank you, Athena. Anything else here for now? 
Can I just ask a question? Absolutely. That that I've had in terms of interpreting the rules in the past. Um, I'm curious about the if if there is a distinction between a motion. I mean, the rules say that a motion for reconsideration is this very specific. You need information and so on, but the, but it's not that specific about amending something that's previously adopted. And I think the motion to amend something that's previously adopted is maybe isn't very clear in terms of how far in the future that can that can happen. Um, and particularly in regard to you know zoning and bylaw changes, there's not really any constraints about when that could be taken up or if it would just be a motion to amend something previously adopted because in those situations we'd have to go through that process again. So I'm just curious about your thoughts. Mandy? Yeah, I'm not sure rule 7.6 changes anything in Robert's rules. And so maybe if we don't modify Robert's rules, we should get rid of the rule in the rule. Um, Robert's rules is because then it becomes unclear, right? Robert's rules is clear that you can't rescind or amend something previously adopted through these motions if some action has already been taken, right? And so you can't rescind a borrowing order if you've already borrowed the money, for example. Um, you know, you can't amend something previously adopted, potentially, uh, I'll use the bylaw, for example, if the bylaw is already in effect. You know, um, you'd have to go through the whole amendment. You, you can obviously amend it, but you can't do it through this rule. You have to propose a bylaw amendment, right? And so is it worth, if we haven't changed anything regarding Robert's rules and we bas basically recited Robert's rules, is it worth even having the rule listed here? I think one of the reasons it was listed was to remind people using our rules essentially as a cheat sheet for Robert's rules. And I'm not sure maybe that's the way we should be using our rules. We should maybe only be putting in rules that we're amending Robert's rules for, and then create a separate cheat sheet of, oh, here are motions and what they can do, right? Um, as an educational tool. So maybe the solution is getting rid of it so that we don't have that confusion about what it is, right? A legislature can always amend a bylaw by going through the process. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't find my unmute button very quickly while I'm sharing screen. I should just take this down. Um, I, I had the same thought about whether or not th this rule is useful since Robert's rule speaks to it. So, and I have been planning some some um, sort of motion language as a as a cheat sheet as part of the retreat and going through some of these things as part of the retreat. Um, it, my understanding is that we we go back to Robert's rules when the rules don't speak to. A, a particular thing. So I think there's a balance between making things easy to find in the rules, even if it's repetitious of Robert's rules, because we maybe use them commonly. And in this situation, it it might make sense to leave it in with a clarifying if it's already been enacted or something that um that it's not ripe for a rescission or amendment or something like that. That's That seems logical. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm since I usually put my foot in my mouth. I'm just noticing that there is a kind of tension in our um, being able to discuss the rules and procedure today, um, and um, that's set. Uh, where are we with this? And Lynn? Pat, I don't think there's a tension. I just think we're not getting as full a perspective because of we're missing some counselors. Okay, we can agree, disagree. Yep. Um, 
Can I also offer that uh, this is going to be a topic, the rules are going to be how to use the rules and, and motions and so forth is going to be a topic for the retreat. And I'm hoping that I get some feedback from counselors about what's going to be helpful to include in that discussion before the retreat. Yeah, I'm, I really would like to have some sense of how we how we integrate Robert's rules and the charter rule or, or our own rules, the town council rules of procedure. Um, and and how we how we call on one or the other, which gives one more precedence or um, whatever. I can answer that right now. Go for it, kid. And not to spoil anything we're going to talk about at the retreat, but federal law, state law, the charter all have precedence over anything we do. Then the, the charter instructs the council to make its own rules. It has to include specific things. And we rely on those rules first. And if anything isn't specifically addressed in our rules, or if there's some, we need clarification that's maybe not as precise in the rules, then we go to Robert's rules. So that's a, yeah, the, the council's rules take precedence under federal and state law and the charter. Okay. They take precedent, the charter takes precedent over the federal and state. No, federal no. and state and then Yeah, I charter. didn't think so. That's why I'm asking for clarification. Yeah, so, so for example, when we go out for borrowing, we need to prove to the lender that we have followed all of those rules, mm -hmm. even the council rules. Gotcha. We followed this that we followed state law, we followed our charter, and we followed our own rules when we've uh, when the council has approved borrowing. So um, and then if there were something that weren't specifically addressed in the council rules, then we we go to Robert, but only in that situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. I do want to hold conversation about rule eight for when Andy can be with us. Um, so, the, uh, and we have the review of non voting liaisons, but again, I think we need a majority, more people, even though we have a quorum, that we should wait. Um, interesting impact. Uh, so I'm trying to see what else. Well, I'm not sure where to go right now. Mandy? Yes. Yeah, so there were a couple of different proposals to rule eight. Um, there was Andy's sort of on, and, and I guess they kind of relate to each other, but I'm not sure. Um, there's Andy's sort of proposal on and I'm not sure it's all in this draft that we have uh, yeah. the changes um, of how things go. And some of his, I think, was clarifying that, yes, does a council have to actually refer a legislative proposal that counselors have proposed, whether it be zoning or non-zoning or policy or whatever, right? I think some of that was clarifying. Some of my proposals relate to more of a committee charge. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm just curious where people think as to, you know, if if there's a number of people that don't like them, we might be able to just not discuss them again. I, I don't know, you know, we're missing a couple members, but, you know, one of the things I was thinking was, you know, that those are in sort of rule 8.2, the referral, and then similar things in 8.6 um, in terms of some of the deletions of thinking about what we actually refer, who which committees and multiple committees do we refer things to, um, particularly as it relates to resolutions, proclamations, and um, you know those those types of things, citations and all. Does GOL need to actually review stuff, um, or is it really the council sponsors that need to make sure if we put out a template that it follows the template, and then the council sponsors own it and it just comes to the council? That might save GOL time. Again, thinking about. Whose time are we saving here? That might save some committee time. Um, and then with the bylaws and all, one thing I've noticed being on GOL and CRC, and I think some people at TSO have noticed it, 
it it's you're reviewing for substance in one committee and then GOL gets it and that's when the attorney sees it and then GOL's like but these are a lot of substantive changes do we send it back don't we and so there's a lot of you know extra review maybe making those reviews combining them into the substantive review so that the committee reviewing for substance also has the benefit of the town attorney's opinion might be more efficient without losing anything and so that that's sort of it would require obviously some charge changes but i don't know how much that relates to what andy's doing or whether we could talk about that separately hmm. lynn yeah i um i agree with mandy joe i once a committee like tso or crc maybe finance but the first two really once they engage in a serious debate and they start um, dealing with the town attorney. I'm trying to figure out what role is GOLs and should that review with the town attorney take place when the real substance of the issue or the measure is, is happening in the committee, in this case, mostly CRC, NGO, and TSO. Um, I, I use today, the measure of the um, water and sewer bylaws. Um, that was reviewed at a serious level, both in finance at one level and certainly in TSO. By the time it came to us, except to have to go to the council to resolve the difference between TSO and GOL's recommendation, um, I really, I'm not clear we what else we were supposed to do today in GOL except pass it on to the council. Mm -hmm. I mean, there is a point where it might be useful if GOL has to be an arbiter. Uh, in this case, in water and sewer, we decided to let the council um, have to make the decision. Um, but it's something to seriously be considered, mm -hmm. and it would change the um charges of committees yeah and um the one i i think there's a lot of logic to what you both shared i'm in terms of saving um gol committee time uh, or committee time uh, i would love to see sponsors take responsibility uh, but when there are errors, you know, Scribner errors or otherwise, that takes up council time if if it's being done there. And so that feels to me like potentially extending, not necessarily by a lot, but depending on what the issues are. Um, if it, So I, I'm not sure that there shouldn't be a review just for uh, form formatting, et cetera, spelling, things like that. We saw those kinds of small errors today. And I don't know if I want to add that to the council. Um, Mandy? So we saw those small errors. Would it have been, um, if, if the proclamation that we reviewed today came to the council without that one small change, would it have been problematic or would it have still sailed through on consent <laughs> um, is number is question number one, right? Uh, but number two is, you know, I've, I've had counselors tell me this in the past. Well, we just leave it for GOL because they do it. And now Lynn's trying to fix some of that, right? But I should not be a sponsor's Scrivener, you know? And so I think, you know, part of this is to try and change counselors' expectations and counselor action right? right um you know if it comes to the council and is a mess and has still 2022 on it because the sponsors didn't do anything with it well then we should refer it back to them or say no and say bring it back next week right table it for you know you can you can motion to postpone to the next council meeting and tell the sponsors come back with something better right fix it um you know i think in a new council we've tried to accommodate everyone and we're finding that that adds 
a lot of time instead of using the tools that are available of things like tabling for the next meeting to fix those things. We do that sometimes with a lot of with a lot like snow and ice. Well, we can't do that here. It was the first reading. We're not bringing it back till we fixed those issues, right? right. I think we need to start doing that for more things saying we're going to table this till the next meeting even though that takes it past the proclamation because sponsors you didn't you weren't prepared. You didn't fix what was obviously fixable. So, yeah. I'm going to look at the Arbor Day month thing then because I said, oh, I, I'll take it on. I'll contact the sponsors. I'll find out, blah, blah, blah. So should, and we voted to do that. So base, in order to have it happen uh, in a timely manner. So it happens for the beginning of April. Um, and in a sense, you're saying, no, nope, that's not the count, the, the GOL's responsibility. Um, um, it's a you know simple example. But, um, and I did not hear back from either sponsor, even after reminding the council sponsor. So um, it, it's an interesting process. Um, and yeah. given how, um, <laughs> given how uh, we spend a lot of time often in council revising things or writing on the fly, uh, which is an enormous amount of time. I'm trying to figure out how do we affect that uh, on seriously, you know, serious, more serious issues. Um, and uh, do we start sending things back then also and saying, I'm sorry, this is not ready. We have, you know, and then whoever is presenting it gets comments from other people. I'm not, I'm really not sure uh, how to do that. That was a ramble. Any other comments or questions right now, since we have decided not to make decisions today? And there only seems to be one more beyond those two big rules, which is 8.9, at least, and then the liaison discussion from my paging through this. Yeah, but they, we're not making decisions, so 8.9, um, we wouldn't vote on anyway, although I can explain why. Yeah, let's get pull it up and then uh, listen to your explanation. So. So, so these are carryovers, which we do once every other year, right? Um, right. And, and I was thinking about A, just refers to GOL, but GOL doesn't do anything on substance, right? So this is automatic carry, carryover doesn't apply if something is met. And one of the things that we said originally was, well, if it's got a negative recommend, recommendation from GOL, which is clear, consistent, and actionable only. And my proposal is to change it to a negative recommendation to any standing to, I guess this says the, but it could be any standing committee of the council to which it was referred. Meaning, for example, you know, a gen, I'll take my street lighting policy bylaw, but it's policy, it's not a bylaw that Anna and I proposed. Um, if it's out of um, TSO with a negative recommendation, but hasn't made it out of GOL, it would automatically go forward. But should it? or should um, the council vote on whether it goes forward to the next council, right? I would hope if it's out of TSO by the time, and it has a negative recommendation by the time it's out of TSO, by the time our term ends, that we'd actually just vote to whether to adopt or not, right? Instead of carry it forward. But, um, you know, do we really wanna be carrying forward items that are mid process that have received a negative recommendation? Or do we wanna make sure whatever the next council is that they get reintroduced if that if those sponsors want to continue with it so that's why i changed it from yeah. gol to any committee yeah thank you lynn yeah i i don't know what, what the change would be but i want to be careful that we don't get caught in a situation like I mean, there was it was not a negative recommendation coming up for water and sewer, 
but there was a difference of opinion between right. two different committees. And I want to make sure that we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater right. in that case. Yeah. Yeah, it seems uh, um, it seems like it, uh, it, the perception can be, and truth may be, that a committee could be stacked in a certain uh, direction or a certain position, and then they always make a negative recommendation. Um, or they always make a positive recommendation, but there's something that needs to be addressed. So how do how would we deal with that? That sort of um, giving away or giving power to something like that. Mandy? So maybe section A, maybe it's better to just delete section A completely and not worry about the recommendation. Section B is if the sponsors aren't going to be in the next session. That one still kind of makes sense to me. Yeah. Um, and C is we would have to potentially re reword C, but um, automatic carryover doesn't apply if a majority of the full council votes to prevent automatic carryover. So maybe mm -hmm. everything that's been referred to and hasn't, um, you know, I think automatic carrier carryover is measures that have not passed the required number of votes by the end of the legislation shall automatically carry over. So that's all of our referrals that just have been there, but are either tabled or postponed or still sitting in committee go to the next session without having to be reintroduced. Maybe sections B and C of this item are enough to, to make that decision without section A at all. Mm. Due to the fact that some committees might always be favorably recommending even if they fail at council completely all the time, right? Um, and and maybe a committee does the other way. They're negatively recommending and then they always seem to pass the council, right? I could say that's potentially possible. So maybe section A isn't needed at all. Hmm. I don't know. It's an interesting idea. Lynn? Yeah, why don't we make a note of that and we'll come yeah. back to it when we have all of our members. So I guess I'm 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 going to hold my comment. Unusual for me. Lynn? Yeah, I just one more comment on that one. Uh, there is presently one item before the council, and that's waste hauler. And just given the magnitude of that issue, it's conceivable that it will have to be carried into the next yeah. session. And I mean, I don't want to predict who's on the council and who's not. But there's got to be some level of looking at those issues in which, you know, we've made some progress. Maybe we're on a timeline. Um, but anyway. Right. Yeah. And that comparing that to um, removing some of the bylaws for future consideration that goes all the way back to the opening of the council. And it's not going to hurt to have them stay on the books. And we keep postponing looking at them because really issues that are more critical come up on a regular basis, even for GOL. Um, so, yeah. I feel um, perhaps we've come to the end of our meeting time for today. I don't know. Oh, uh, minutes, 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 minutes. minutes. Okay, I move that we accept the minutes from March 1st um, as presented. Is there a second? Second. Okay, um, vote Lynn Griesmer. Aye. 
Mandy Joe Haneke. Aye. Patricia DeAngelis is an aye also, and I don't think this will um, ruffle feathers. Um, I do want to say something, which I think there's a real misunderstanding on, on the public's uh, part about what being on consent agenda means. Um, I know, uh, and I, I, if we had, okay, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to say that when something is on consent agenda, it doesn't disappear and it's not automatic. Any counselor can remove an item and that item then just goes into action items. And, and I, I think that there is a, a false sense that it disappears. The other thing that I've experienced is even something that has been voted on on the consent agenda has a discussion later in the meeting. Uh, and that's really important. And the public seems to not uh, have clarity about that issue. And I can understand why, because it can get confusing. Um, my concern, well, Okay, I'm gonna let Lynn speak and then I'll see if I need to say what I was gonna say. Lynn? Uh, no, I, Pat, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Please go ahead. No, that's okay. No. Uh, it's interesting, since we have gone to hybrid mode, um, all votes have to be taken um, by roll call. And that's frankly adds to the time of the meeting. Although God, I try to whip through those names as fast as I can. But when you have 10 roll call votes, you're, you're really adding time. So the consent agenda, uh, I have a couple things to say. The consent agenda allows us to vote for something, even if later in the meeting, we're gonna provide more information about it. I think that actually helps save some time. The issue that I think, um, I have noticed, and it's been on more than one occasion, but it was most recently this that, this last week, and that is um, the whole issue around public comment did go on the consent agenda because how it was voted coming out of GOL. The reality is, as president, I could have taken it off the consent agenda as soon as we saw how the public was feeling about that, and instead. You know, I left it on and then you, Pat, made the motion or took it off. And we proceeded with the discussion we were going to have to have. So um, I think it's uh, part of it is just being more sensitive to if there's issues that have been put on consent, but we're seeing a, a, a groundswell of public comment about it uh, through emails and general public comment or whatever else, then we might just, you know, understand that the president is going to take it off. I periodically also uh, do get an email from a counselor or two sometimes um, giving me a heads up that they're going to take something off the consent agenda. And that's useful. Sometimes it's because it's for any number of reasons, sometimes because they just want to be able to say more. Sometimes it's because um, they want to make a Scribner change they think is critical. Uh, there's any number of reasons why they may take it off. But um, I think your other two, your other statements about consent are absolutely correct. But one of the reasons consent has become most more important to us is that since we went to the hybrid mode and we have never yet had 13 counselors in the room at the same time, except for the retreat <laughs> we had last February, we can't okay. take raised hand votes. We mm -hmm. have to take roll call. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, yeah. Anyway, I would like to. I really support the consent agenda and removed the item around public comment because of the groundswell. I think that. Um, I think that was important and it was a, a listening. I also want to re restate that the four counselors who were here, um, each one of us suggested some of those changes and each one of us, myself, you, Lynn, Mandy Joe, and Michelle, uh, unanimously voted 
to have those changes made. And, you know, and I think it doesn't mean that we don't change our mind or things like that, but I think that it becomes important when instead of demonizing people um, that we understand that hey, there were some people that you normally aren't mad at who also made this decision and share the responsibility. Four of us made the decision. Four of us were responsible for uh, changing uh, and moving, making a motion to change uh, 5.1. Um, so anyway. Um, I, I just want to correct one thing, Pat. We didn't make a motion to change. We made a motion to, to recommend, recommend to the town yes. council. Yes. And, you know, then we saw a groundswell. And I think any number of us probably would have changed our vote. I know that I actually wondered whether or not I should vote to just sink the whole thing in the town council meeting. But frankly, I, because I feel that those suggestions were made in the context of a larger set of issues of how do we shorten town council meetings that it needed to come back to the committee regardless. And then it turned out with the SJC ruling that was released the next day, it needed to come back anyway, so. Right. Any other comments from counselors? Any other agenda item that I have forgotten or overlooked? Okay. Then I'm going to um, move that we, Mandy, do, are you going to say something? No. Then I move that I'm we. I'm ready to hit leave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to uh, make uh, adjourn the meeting at 11:22 a.m. Thank you. Thank you, Athena. Thank you, Pat. Athena, could you stay on for a second? I just have a couple of qu chairing questions, and the public is welcome to stay. I don't care. Um, I basically what I'd like to do is and and I do it better in person is Hang on. Pat, it would be better if we joined a different thing so gotcha. it's, cl it's gotcha. clear the meeting okay. is over and okay. I'm gonna stop yes yes all right see you later I'll send you